We're delighted today to have Eric Varnas here, the chief economist of Statoil, to present Statoil's outlook uh, for uh, the global uh, energy market and what they see on the horizon. Uh, you all have smartphones. You can look up uh, more about Statoil if you need to. I won't uh, go through a lot of detail, but um, Statoil's uh, one of the world's uh, largest uh, uh, oil companies, seventh largest uh, oil and gas company, um, <clears throat> second largest supplier of natural gas into the European market, production of about two million uh, barrels a day. Uh, and uh, interesting, I think, because they pin so much of their potential projected growth on the North American market. It'll be interesting to hear uh, Eric's perspective on North American production uh, outlook. And it's also interesting because I think Statoil as a company uh, is something we can hear from and learn from. You know, in the U.S., the oil and gas industry consistently ranks among the least popular industries uh, uh, in, 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 in the U.S. Uh, uh, business sector. Um, Statoil comes from a different perspective where they uh, have a long history of ownership by the government and the public and uh, have a history of operating in some of the harshest conditions in the world. We were just talking about the tragic attacks in Algeria in January that killed 40 people at one of their gas plants the Norwegian continental shelf, some of the harshest environmental conditions, and operating in these places in a way where they try to maintain the public confidence of the people of Norway, uh, which is a little bit of a different uh, history than the U.S. public has with uh, the oil and gas sector here. So uh, I'm always interested to hear what Statoil has to say uh, about the global energy market, about the North American energy market. I'm really delighted that uh, they could be with us here today uh, to present their uh, <clears throat> energy perspective, their out long run uh, outlook for the macroeconomy and for the energy market, and then we'll have an opportunity for discussion and question with Eric uh, after that. So uh, thank you all for coming to uh, another event from the Center on Global Energy Policy uh, here at Columbia. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, thanks for allowing us to be in a room with uh, one of our most famous uh, Scandinavian fellows on the wall. He's not Norwegian, but still, we, we feel like, uh, like he belongs to, to us as well. Uh, my name is Eric Warnes. I'm the chief economist of Statoil. Uh, my responsibility is to give advice to those who want to listen, both inside and outside the company, about where the world's energy markets are going. And as part of that, uh, macroeconomics is also important. Uh, I'm also um, part-time uh, on the board of governors of, of the Central Bank of Norway, so I'm now eagerly following uh, the list of candidates that fall off, fall out of the list of uh, Barack Obama to, to follow Ben Bernanke. But uh, that's going to be exciting to see who that will be, because that's an important position also for Norwegian interest rates. But today my topic is uh, our outlook for, uh, for the global energy markets to 2040. As we saw it um, in June, when we updated the data and the forecasts, uh, th since then, of course, things have changed as well. But uh, but uh, to what extent they have impact on our outlook to 2040 is uh, probably doubtful. We, uh, these uh, short-term changes uh, tend to be big, but they, ten they tend to be short-term. And, and when you have a 2040 perspective, at least, on some of our investments, we need to, to take a, uh, take a long, long view and, and, uh, and sit still and look through some of these uh, short-term changes and, and judge whether they have serious impact or not. Uh, the focus of the presentation will be on demand, but I'll, I'll show you some supply figures as well. Um, given my role and given the, the fact that we're in a competitive business, I will be very careful in telling you what my price forecast is. But um, you can ask questions and then I'll see what I answer. Um, the reason why we focus on demand, I guess, is that um, our, it's, it's colored by our view that um, there is sufficient resources in the ground so that energy demand will be uh, energy consumption will be determined by demand in one sense and not by supply uh, and in particular that goes for some of the fossil fuels where we've had recently a debate on on peak oil and so on well we do have peak oil but we have peak oil demand and not peak oil supply in our forecast so it's, it's very much driven by macroeconomics uh, assumptions on energy intensity per sector and per region and per country and, and then you end up with, with an energy mix and an energy demand per fuel. And that's what I'll come back to. It's a long-term outlook. Uh, our assumptions and our forecasts indicate that global GDP growth will be roughly the same over the next 30 years as, as it has been over the la last 30 years, 2.8% per year as a cumulative average growth rate. 
the non-OECD countries, the countries that are outside of OECD now, uh, will grow much faster than the countries inside uh, and uh, will then have a much larger impact on global economic growth going forward than what, they've ha what they have had. So but we'll have this uh, two-speed, two or th even three-speed economy going forward and, and where the non-OECD countries and the emerging economies in Asia in particular catch up with the rest of us and become, per, in per capita terms, I guess China will be roughly as, e as rich in 2030 as, as uh, South Korea is today. Uh, the overall energy market outlook then depends on our assumptions on, and forecasts on, on the development of energy intensity, energy efficiency, and sectoral growth, and so on. And, and we assume that we'll get back to the long-term trend of improving energy efficiency, so that per dollar of GDP, we use less and less energy. Over the last 10 years, we have not, that's not been the situation on a global scale because of the, the heavily energy-driven growth in Asia. So energy intensity has been roughly flat over the last 10 years, but we believe that we'll come back to a situation where energy intensity improves, driven by higher prices, saturation of some markets, and so on, so that energy use will grow much less than GDP, 1.3% per year, which is roughly in line. I'll come back to, to where we are compared to other forecasters, but we're roughly in line with with sort of the bulk of, of uh, those that dare to stick their head out and say anything about energy demand to 2035 and 2040. Uh, most, most banks, when you ask them, they, they don't look that far out into the future, but some of us have to. Uh, oil and coal demand will grow much less than, uh, than energy demand and thereby lose market share, but still grow as we, far, as we see it on average to 2040. But, we, but oil demand will peak around 2030 in our forecasts. Uh, gas demand increases and increases faster. Natural gas increases faster than overall energy demand and, and then takes market share at the expense of the other two fossil fuels, uh, which is one reason why the global CO2 emissions in our forecast don't grow that much. But they still grow, and they still grow way beyond what is necessary in order to reach anything like a two-degree scenario or 450 ppm, as the IEA calls it. And I'll come back to that as well. And we see very strong growth in new renewables, which is with new renewables is, uh, is wind, solar, and geothermal, uh, mainly. Uh, we see a growth of some 8 to 9 percent per year, which is, which is really a lot when you look at it in terms of how much you have to install and how much capacity you have to grow, how many grids you have to build on a global scale. But the problem, in, in one sense, is that the, they start out at almost zero. So they will, do, they will have a chunk of global energy demand in 2040, but, uh, but uh, it will still be relatively small because it starts out from such a small level. And as long as both oil, coal, and gas grows, CO2 emissions will continue to grow. Even though we are, we are compared to others, I guess, so yeah, we're relatively optimistic in terms of CCS, carbon capture and storage, starting to take effect towards the, the end of the forecasting period. And I'll come back to that as well. And when making these forecasts, the starting point is often important, and sort of the, the mindset at which we do it. And coming out of the financial crisis, um, at least we in the West, in the, in the OECD areas, we're struggling in terms of understanding what's going on. And there's a lot of uncertainty framing the development and framing our ability to forecast. And it's easy to become a pessimist. Uh, the, a lot of people run around saying that the world is now characterized by what they call VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Difficult to understand what's going on. Black swans coming at us all the time. Conflicts are difficult to solve. Uh, the G20 doesn't work as a G20, and some people are talking about a G0 world, so nobody knows what to do in Syria. Fortunately, something happened over the weekend that seems that something is moving put potentially in the right direction. But, uh, but it still is that some conflicts seem difficult to solve, at least with the Western hat on. Uh, it has been difficult, and it still is difficult to generate economic growth after the financial crisis in the, in the stagnant economies of the OECD. Uh, and it seems uh, very optimistic to believe that we, within the next uh, decade or so, will have regulations or agreements in place that would ensure a more sustainable path in terms of CO2 emissions and climate change. It, Things as, as they are developing globally don't point in that direction when you look at the increase in coal-fired power plants in, in India and China, for instance, and when you see at how the develop, and, and in fact, when you see 
that CO2 emissions are also increasing in Germany in spite of a tremendous growth in renewable energy because they combine it with coal instead of gas. So it's, in one sense, easy to be pessimistic, and that could flavor our forecast. On the other hand, there's a lot of things that are going in the right direction, too, and in particular when you put a different hat on, when you put on an Eastern hat or, a, or an Asian hat or an emerging economies hat or a developing economies hat. There's a lot of good things going on. Uh, Japan has started to grow. Uh, other emerging economies continue to grow a lot, even though they don't seem to be able to keep the, the to some extent, the double-digit growth rates that we, in a sense, got used to in terms of China, but still grow. Um, lots of people, hundreds of millions of people, are moving out of poverty and into a middle-class affluence. Uh, I saw a statistics by, I think it was uh, either the World Bank or UNDP, where the number of people living on, on, on a minimum dollar amount for, for subsist, subsistence, subsistence level has, go, has gone down by several hundred millions in a period where the global population has grown by more than a billion. So, so a lot of things are, ha are happening and going in the right direction. Uh, countries, many countries in Africa are growing for decades with m very high growth rates from low levels, but still. Um, we live much longer. The likelihood of dying tomorrow is much, is much less. Uh, technological progress and opportunities are changing lives in terms of communication, in terms of health service, etc. So there's a lot of good things happening as well. And then what, what do we believe in? Well, and given that our commodity, at least one of them, the world's most important commodity is impossible to predict, um, at least by the economist. And I should admit that for most of us it's difficult to predict. Uh, we tend to believe that when things change in the oil market, it changes forever, and it doesn't. So, and this is the this is sort of the, the one of the key prices that we have to uh, have a we have to have an attitude towards that price because it's one of the most important parameters in terms of de determining whether a long-term investment is profitable or not. And and given the history of this price and and how it's affected by supply and demand, and how it seems impossible to predict, with, even within a half-year span during 2005, the economist ch changed his view right in the, in the summer of 2005, depending on whether the price went up or down. So it is difficult, and, and sort of the, what is the world that will determine this price? And the same thing with, with uh, when you look at the development of gas, natural gas prices, which are regional prices, the, difference, the different development of the Asian gas price over the last years compared to the Henry Hub, the American gas price. Very few people predicted that, that was going to happen. And one of the reasons was that we failed to see that the US would not be a large importer of gas, but was instead becoming in, coming into a position where it could export gas. And that's, of course, an important factor that when, when you miss that, then you also miss the price protection. So with that as a background, uh, this is a very short picture of our medium term. Uh, macroeconomic outlook, uh, where I guess the, the headline that describes our forecast over the next four or five years would be muddled through, sort of where, where the U.S. will gradually continue, gradually grow slightly faster, uh, household demand is picking up, uh, there is cash in the companies, uh, limited by fiscal consolidation, the big, one of the big uncertainties is what's going to happen to fiscal, the fiscal policy when you look some years into the future, but still growing. Europe, finally out of recession, or parts of the, the parts of Europe that are in the Eurozone, I should say, that's a, let's specify that, for instance, Norway is not in the Eurozone and not the country of the, of the Swedish guy either. So, but but the, most, the most important parts of Europe are finally out of recession seem to be climbing, a lot of uncertainty, and very low growth rates, but still in positive territory. And, and some of the downside risks in terms of euro breakup and, and, so, and things like that seem to have subsided. Um, and Germany and the large countries in the northern part of the eurozone are now driving the recovery. Uh, still a lot of uncertainty about, uh, about the sustainability of the banks, balance sheets, and so on. And, and some of the banks in, in countries like France and Italy are very, first of all, they're very large. Some of the, the French banks are among the largest in the world. And it's, it's in, that, in this sense, a relatively small country. And they're also extremely exposed to, to public sector debt in Southern Europe. So there is a lot of uncertainty, but still, seems to be growing. Risk premiums seem to have come down. And the, 
there might be reason to believe that the eurozone will continue to grow and therefore give a not a much but a little bit of a boost to some energy demand uh, japan is now growing very specific reasons uncertain how, how long that will last in terms of, of uh, liquidity being put into the market relative extremely lenient monetary policy how long that can be sustained but at least there, something seems to have shifted in japan which has not grown for very long and is growing so how long will abenomics run the forecast for, for, for Japan is one of the uncertainties. But together, this combined to a slightly more positive outlook for the OECD for the next couple of, couple of years, two, three years, than what we saw about a year ago. And then the emerging economies, where the rebalancing of the Chinese growth model maybe is the most visible and most difficult um, thing to predict. Uh, but it's, there are some reasons to be optimistic ab about it in terms of being able to keep growth rates at 65 to 7.5%. A gradual shift to something that is less export intensive, slightly less energy intensive, possibly consum more consumption driven, but with a lot of uncertainty around debt levels, for instance, in local governments and local uh, companies. And the same thing with other emerging economies who now see uh, capital movements going out instead of in because of uncertainty about what's happening when, when the Fed starts pulling back on their liquidity measures because of increasing risk premium, because of increasing uncertainty about the growth model also in countries like India and Brazil, potentially also Russia. So there's a lot of uncertainty, and especially the countries that are depending on China, China seem to be uncertain. So some moderation of emerging economies growth, and, but slightly more optimistic on the OECD, which then bodes for energy demand growing 1.5 to 2% per year uh, over the next 5 to 10 years. And, and with, a, with a, something like uh, close to a million barrels per day in terms of oil demand growth for the next years, some years. Then going, uh, moving away from sort of this business cycle, medium term way of looking at it, and then towards the longer term where we, for macroeconomics, have to start talking about productive capacity and productivity and so on. There's one major trend, which is affecting everything. It has been for a while, and it will. And it's, it's, I call this the, sort of the democratic consequence of the, of the economic wonder in Asia. Because the effect of it is that the money will be where the people are. And it's turning back uh, to the historical fact that the point of gravity in economic sense was in Asia until the Industrial Revolution. Then it started to move westwards. It passed Norway at the, the start of the Second World War. And it turned, uh, turned back from Norway around 1960, which is the point in 1960 is an island that Norway claims to have the rights to. It's called Jan Mayen. And then it turns back and is on its way back through Russia and will end up in Asia. This is sort of the economic point of gravity. The point about this chart is that uh, it's a very strong trend that we believe will continue, and it will affect also energy demand. And the, and the, and the chart on the right shows shares of energy demand consumed by different regions in, from 2000 to 2040. And note that the OECD countries used 50% of the global energy in 2000, will go down to about 30% of a larger number, but still in 2040, while China grows from some 10, 11% of global energy used to more than 20, 20, close to 25 at the end. And the same goes for other emerging economies as well. And that's a strong trend. So, so forecasting energy demand, uh, forecasting the use of oil in the transportation sector, Forecasting the number of vehicles on the roads in the world is all about forecasting what's happening in Asia. If you make that wrong, uh, it, it almost doesn't matter what, what other mistakes you do in forecasting because the numbers are so big. Uh, as an example, I, I won't come back to that, but as an example, um, Singapore currently has 100 vehicles per 1,000 people. The U.S. has some 900. Uh, Korea has about 350. And China, if it chooses, I mean, China could choose to build this new cities model like Singapore, make it very difficult for people to buy cars. It costs about $60,000 just to get the permit to buy a car in Singapore. Build public transportation. They have, they're building new mega cities. If they choose Singapore or they let markets develop so that it ends up at Korea or even higher in 2030, 2035. The difference between those two figures, right, 350 and 100 per 1,000, multiply that by 1.3 billion people. 
and you get close to 300 million cars in difference between those two models. And then you add on how much will they drive, not as much as you guys, as the Americans. Probably not as much as Norwegians, but somewhere around what we, the average European drives, maybe. And you add on some assumptions on hydroelectric, uh, you know, hybrid cars and full electric and so on, and you, you get a, a difference in oil demand, which could be somewhere between two and five million barrels per day. And that's a lot. And that's just Chinese private transportation. So all these numbers about when you have 1.3 billion people in India, 1.3 billion in China, you have several hundred millions in many other countries in Asia, is what is driving our forecast. And we, we're struggling to get it right, but we hope to be vaguely right and not precisely wrong, at least. So then this is the sort of the, the combination of some of the things that I've said when you look at it from, you start out with our economic growth assumptions on the left, go through our energy intensity assumptions, and then you end up with global energy demand to the right. And these bars show our, the average growth rates for three regions in the world for, for the next decades, including two decades of history. So the, the pink one there, magenta one, is, is, the, is the growth rates for the last decade, and then you have the growth rates going forward. And you see that we're, we're assuming a tapering off, a reduction in non-OECD growth. We believe that China, China's GDP will grow by some 4% per year during the 30s, in the last decade here, um, because of, of a re re reduction in or decline in labor force size, for instance, reduction in the potential of moving people out of relatively low productivity agriculture into higher productivity manufacturing and so on. So, so the growth potential of China will go down. But still, we believe it's going to grow by 4% per year, which is substantial when you take that over a 10-year period. India will grow slightly faster, we think. The potential is there. Struggling with structural reforms at the moment uh, could grow faster, but doesn't. But we believe it will grow faster than China when you come towards the end of the period. That translates into the middle line in the middle chart, which is GDP growth going forward. Of course, it won't be as smooth as it looks later, there. When you look at history, it's, it's, gonna, it's going to change. But the average is there, 2.8% per year. And then you have the light blue line at the top, which is the energy intensity development that we, historically has been and then what we assume. And you see there that energy intensity in terms of energy use per dollar of GDP went down, then stayed flat over the last decade, and then we believe it will come down again. Uh, one of the reasons is that the world is, has still not gotten used to oil prices at $100 per barrel. It's only five years ago that that happened. And, and uh, the average oil price over the, over the last 30 years has been some $50 per barrel in, in real terms. So one, that's one of the reasons. Energy has become more expensive, in spite of what you would think if you look at your Henry Hub price here. So we will, that's one of the reasons. Then I talked about uh, transportation. As more economies mature, uh, you'll get more moderate demand, uh, more efficient cars. Uh, Obama has agreed with the, oil, the car industry that the, the fuel efficiency of cars should come up, fuel intensity should go down, et cetera, et cetera. So we believe it's going to go back, and we get a 40% improvement in energy intensity throughout the period. That translates into the energy demand growth at the bottom of that middle chart, and then you have the overall level in terms of energy demand growth to the right. And you see that the OECD countries hardly will use more energy at all going forward. So it will keep roughly pace with energy intensity will be roughly, energy intensity improvement will roughly compensate for the GDP growth that we assume. So the, the whole growth in energy demand will be outside the countries that are currently in the OECD. And in particular, in terms of size, look at Asia. And that's because that's where the people are. And that's where the growth is. Uh, due to the coloring in, in stock oil, the, the gradual greening of energy mix looks like a gradual uh, pinking. Or, but it's, we see a gradually greener energy mix. Renewables grow much faster. New renewables grow much faster than other types of energy demand. But still, Fossil fuels will, uh, will constitute some between two-thirds and three-fourths of, of overall energy demand, down from above 80 percent currently to some 72. Uh, new renewables grow faster, and that's, that's, one of the, or that's the main reason why this uh, uh, pink part at the top is growing at all. Uh, other types of renewables, old renewables, will, st will also grow, but not that fast. And that's uh, hydroelectricity and, and biomass and waste and so on. Uh, 
gas will grow at the expense of coal and oil, uh, coal and oil. So, so in terms of CO2 emissions per unit of energy, the fossil fuel composition in 2040 will be slightly less CO2 intensive than, than what we have currently because coal demand or the coal share is going down. And note then that there are still very large regional differences in, in fuel mix based on where the resource is. In the regions where you have a lot, where there is a lot of coal, coal will still be used. Uh, we assume that the coal share in China's energy demand will go down from some 60 to 50 percent, but that's a lot more coal being burnt in 2040 than now because their energy demand is increasing so much. Right? And, and that is the, 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 the short and medium term outlook in terms of coal, coal demand is what is the huge challenge for any type of climate policy. Um, Dieter Helm, in, in a professor in, in England, showed last year and a year and a half ago, I think, that the, 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 the current increase in coal-fired power plants, or the new builds of coal-fired power plants in India and China alone, is equivalent, if we were to compensate for that in Europe or, or anywhere else, it's equivalent to building 1,000 of these huge wind, windmills per week. So some 50, 52,000 windmills per year and replace then coal-fired or whatever here just to compensate for the growth in coal-fired power plants. So that's, I mean, the, the, the increase in coal demand in, in the world is the challenge for CO2 emissions. Other than that, uh, natural gas is growing in the regions where we use a lot of gas currently, uh, where we have a lot of gas, and, and in North America in particular. Um, in China, we assume that uh, they will use all the energy sources they can get a hold of. They need it all. And they will probably develop some of their own gas from shale gas gradually. And, and, uh, and even though it, in terms of ratios or shares, the, the light blue over there doesn't look that big. But it's a lot of, that's a lot more gas going into China, being used in China than currently. Also LNG imports. Not only their own gas, not only Turkmenistan piped gas, but also LNG imports. Maybe from the US, or the, at least North America. That could also be a nice way to do something about the perpetual trade deficit that the US has with China, right? Start exporting some more gas. And as I've said, fossil fuels are here to stay. This is oil and gas demand. Uh, we believe that the, the OECD oil demand has peaked. So that any increase in our use of transportation, which will continue to increase, not much, but it will continue to increase, is compensated by uh, more fuel efficient uh, means of transportation, new types of technology in, in cars, and so on. So oil demand in OECD area will go down. But it will be compensated by increases elsewhere. And we have here a peak roughly at 2030. That's when. Uh, fuel efficiencies, uh, new types of fuels, uh, saturation of transportation markets also in, in Asia starts to kick in. And lower economic growth in addition, so you get lower underlying energy demand growth, and that's why it peaks. Of course, it's, that's an assumption depending on what type of price you have. But, uh, but uh, we believe that prices, technology, and overall demand and saturation then combined to give it a peak in oil demand. Gas demand, on the other hand, continues to grow throughout the period. Uh, it will grow also substantially outside of Asia in, in the rest of the world. For instance, in the Middle East, where they need more gas, both to produce more oil, but also more gas to produce electricity. So, so gas demand outside of OECD is also growing substantially. And note the little sliver at the top there, where we assume now that the you will gradually get more gas used also in international bunkers, which is shipping and aviation. And in this, in this particular example, sh shipping, where uh, shipping will both due to regulations, potentially also to prices, but in particular to environmental concerns and regulations, be forced to use natural gas instead of heavy fuel oil to, to draw, run their ships. And I mean, the, the typical example would be an LNG vessel, right, which already has gas on board and can use gas for its engine. So we, we see that coming in as well. We also see some gas in the transportation sector onshore, 
in trucking and so on, etc. And of course, indirectly, a lot of gas will be used in transportation when you come to 2030 through electricity. And this is where the oil is supposed to come from. Uh, there are two main messages in this. Um, one is that uh, the decline rates in conventional oil production in outside of OPEC, which is the left chart, is for the next decade or so compensated by the increase in un what we now call unconventional oil production. And the, the best example of that is, is the tight oil revolution in, in the Norwegian parts of North Dakota, I should say. There's, there, are, there are lots of Norwegians that have gotten phone call from American lawyers the last years and saying that, do you know that you have inherited your old uh, grandfather's uncle who used to own land in North Dakota? And we've started to drill there, and there's oil. You have a check coming your way. Uh, and the non-OPEC tight oil there is mainly, in, for the first decade or so, is North America, and in particular the US. And then we also assume that, that that type of technology will be used and applied in other resources around the world. For instance, there is a huge uh, source rock underneath all the oil fields in Western Siberia and Russia which can be produced in terms of tight oil technically. We don't know how prolific it is. It's probably not like Bakken in North Dakota, but it's still. So we, we believe that there will come something there. But the above ground types of conditions are very different from, in the, from the US, both in China, in Russia, in Argentina, where these resources are bound to exist. As long as you have coal, gas, or oil, you, you also have unconventional oil. But it will take time. But that compensates for the decline together with, with increases in NGL and also some increase in oil sands, in particular in Canada, but not, nothing dramatic. Uh, so non-OPEC oil production is increasing. And then we have relatively moderate demand growth. And if you combine that with the need to allow Iraqi production to grow, Saudi Arabia will be in a tight position in terms of how much oil they can produce in order not to flow the market with oil, flood the market with oil. So the next decade or so, Saudi Arabia's production will, be, will have to moderate, unless the situation they're in right now turns out to be permanent. When we, we made this forecast before we realized that Libya's production fell by a million dollars again, a million barrels again, right now. So, so those types of, of uh, supply disruptions could allow Saudi Arabia to keep their production higher. But, but until 2025, OPEC is struggling to keep its market share. And in particular, when you allow Iraq in, that's a big uncertainty, by the way, how, how big Iraqi oil production will be and can be. But the oil is there. The above ground risks are formidable, formidable. But still, but then after 2025, we believe that OPEC is back in business in terms of increasing its market share and compensating for falling non-OPEC production. So that's how that looks. That could be, it could, we could be wrong. We're probably, in terms of details, we're certainly wrong. But hopefully we're vaguely right in terms of the big picture. Uh, in terms of new sources of oil and gas for that matter, but in particular oil, uh, we have been surprised uh, over the last years, in particular by the, by the tight oil production or potential, I should say, and increasing wealth productivity and, and how much oil we can actually get out of, of resources like Eagle Ford and Bakken and, uh, and other res reservoir source rocks in the US. So that's a, it's sort of the, the, the supply curve has gotten some, it, it's become flatter in parts and, and we've got some new sources. The, the magenta parts in there are, are, are illustrations of how we think about the potential new production that could come out of those resources and what they will cost. And the conclusion is that it will, it's relatively expensive. There's a large variation, of course, and, and uh, you, you drill the sweet spots first, and the source rock is nice, and you get out of relatively much oil at a decent pressure and a decent quality. But then you start drilling something next door, and it's not that uh, prolific. So you get large variations in marginal cost. But the, the general conclusion is that this cannot be produced over time at $20, $25 about. Um, we do make some conventional discoveries, surprisingly, somewhere. For instance, the closest oil field to Stavanger, where Statoil has its main office, 
It's 140 kilometers out in the North Sea. We made a discovery two years ago. Uh, huge, for Norwegian standards, it's going to be the third, fourth, or fifth largest field in Norway. That comes in at relatively low marginal costs. But these new sources, oil sands, uh, tight oil, and so on, cannot be produced at 25, 30, 40 dollars. So yes, there is potential for more oil if we need it, but we have to pay for it. And the Wood Mackenzie chart to the right sort of confirms the same, the same thing in terms of U.S. tight oil and, and mining. And then you have ultra deep water. And then sort of the. It's always a question what, for an economist like me. It's always a question what's con, what's conventional oil and what's unconventional oil. I, I used to say that for an economist, uh, conventional oil is is what we produced yesterday, and unconventional oil is what we couldn't produce yesterday, but what we can, but, but that we can produce today. But in terms of geology, of course, the unconventional oil is different because it's in source rock. It's not in a, it's not in a traditional captured deal of, of oil. But, but uh, the ultra deep water in Brazil, in Angola, under salt, is in many ways extremely unconventional. It's, yeah. it's a high pressure, high temperature, extremely deep water. But, it, but, but it, it's a traditional conventional source rock so, or source. So that's why we call it conventional oil. But that's also expensive. So don't expect, uh, for the long term, we believe that oil prices will be guided by the marginal costs, long-term marginal costs. For the medium term and short term, the oil prices can go up and down relative to that. But for the long term, we think the marginal cost is an indication of where what the oil price will be. And, and looking at it, it, don't believe that oil prices should go back to the $25 we used to talk about when you look forward. A little bit about gas before I conclude. Um, this is the regional distribution of gas demand, as we see it. Uh, it grows in all regions, in particular, as I said, in, in non-OECD Asia and, and outside of, of Asia, in Latin America and the Middle East. Uh, one key uncertain factor about global gas markets going forward is uh, to what extent will they integrate and become more like an oil market? Uh, currently, we have three large markets that are partly integrated, but only partly. And, then, and the key factor for that is, the, is the, how much LNG supply will we have. And the chart to the right shows our expectations for LNG supply to 2030. New, new areas of, of, uh, of LNG which would link these markets together, and we, which then will set a limit as to how, for how long price differentials can be large. And currently, the price differential between uh, gas sold to an Asian power uh, company that has to compensate for, for taking out all the nuclear power after, uh, after Fuku the Fukushima tragedy, and where the alternative is to fuel it with oil. That price is much higher. It's, it's five times at least as high as the Henry Hub price here. That differential cannot be sustained if we're able to build LNG supply. But that doesn't, if you build LNG export terminals here to supply Asia with gas, the price differential will not be zero because it does cost five, six, seven dollars per MMBTU to transport, to, to cool the gas down and transport it to Asia. But there's a limit as to how big that difference can be. So that's the key uncertainty there. Uh, also here, some of these. Uh, New sources of, of uh, LNG is exciting in terms of uh, opening up the possibility for new regions to be part of the global energy game. We have huge gas discoveries now in Mozambique and Tanzan Tanzania, which are very exciting for the people there. Very challenging. Fantastic location in terms of uh, LNG, LNG potential, both going both to Asia and to Europe. But of course, with a lot of challenges on, on in terms of above ground risk, in terms of how much money should go back into the governments, how you can use the gas to develop the electricity systems in countries that don't have electricity, etc., etc. Large challenges, but also extremely exciting opportunities. But not cheap. And the same thing with Australian LNG. It's expensive. It's not three dollar per MMBTU like you have here. Which to some sense, it's probably too low a price also to, to reflect marginal costs here. There are many reasons why the Henry Hub price is that low. 
Then CO2, as I've said, the chart to the right shows our forecast for CO2 emissions, and then we combine it with, or we compare it to the three different scenarios of, of the International Energy Agency. Uh, as long as oil, coal, and gas demand grows, and you're not extremely optimistic about our C opportunities to take the CO2 out of that through carbon capture and storage, then CO2 emissions will grow. Uh, and they do here. Uh, what we have assumed, and our emissions grow slightly faster than those of the IEA, that has to do with slightly different growth assumptions in different regions with different energy mix and so on. That's why we come slightly higher than the IEA's base case, which is this new policy scenario. Both of those are character characterized by having CO2 emissions much higher than the 450 ppm, which is the, the level that is necessary to avoid a temperature increase of more than 2 degrees with 50% probability. Um, so there's a challenge there, as I said, and it has partly to do with, the, or mainly to do with the increase in, in coal-fired emissions in, in emerging economies. Uh, we believe, or we have introduced the assumption that gradually you have regional climate regimes, not a global climate agreement, but regional climate regimes that combine to, to have an explicit or implicit price on carbon uh, that will have an effect on demand as you go towards 2030 and 2040. Nothing like what we have in Norway where we currently pay some uh, $80 per ton of CO2, both the oil companies and the private consumers when they fill their gas tank. Uh, but, but something like 30 to $50 per ton. We also believe that that will, together with other technological improvements, combine to make CCS start to have an impact. So we have assumed that a certain share of, of coal-fired power plants here in different regions will have CCS towards the 2040, will gradually be introduced. And the size of the CO2 emissions that we reduce is 6%, two and a half billion tons. And, and just to put it into perspective, we're, we're now running a, we're running a project in Norway where we try to, 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 to get this, make this possible, where we take out a million tons out of one plant. So what we assume is that we'll have two and a half thousands of those globally, or some, it could be 250, but then it would have to be 10 times as big. It's a huge investment. So CCS might be possible, but it will require a lot of capital. Not only to the capturing technology, but also the storage thing. You have to transport all that CO2. You basically say that you, you'll have a double grid in terms of na natural gas pipelines. You, you get the methane in, you burn the gas or you burn the coal, and then you, get, you have to transport the CO2 somewhere to store it. It's a huge challenge. Uh, it will probably be possible, depending on the CO2 price, but it's going to cost money. And here we have 6%. We, ha we have roughly the same reduction in CO2 emissions here due to CCS in our base case as the IEA has its, in its 450 ppm scenario. So we're relatively optimistic on that. Just finally, this is our forecast for energy demand in North America. I'll be quick. We, uh, we don't talk specifically about the U.S. because we are, uh, we are loyal to the IEA definition and then OECD North America is one region in IEA statistics and that, uh, that uh, combines Canada, U.S. and Mexico. This is the overall energy demand. Uh, GDP growth of 2.3% on average. Uh, much less growth in energy demand. Um, new renewables grow in, roughly in line with the global average, 8.5% annually. And renewables and gas then take market share at the expense of oil and coal. And, and one of the key uncertainties is, of course, that given the development in, or sort of the, the changing prospects of, of natural gas production following the shale gas revolution, the big question is, how will that gas be used? Will it be demanded locally or, or domestically in the power sector in a remanufacturing of parts of the U.S. or in the transportation sector or as LNG exports. Will there be sufficient demand for all that gas or not? We believe there is. Uh, we believe that uh, there will be some LNG exports that will have an impact on global markets, global prices. But also we believe that there will be more gas into manufacturing and transportation, in particular LNG into truck, the trucking sector. 
So North America should use this, up, and also could, part of this gas will be used to produce oil sands in Canada. But uh, at least North America has gotten a new energy source that it could use and where it also could export. And then the final slide is just to show you where we are in terms of forecast compa compared to others. And, and I sh should say that we're roughly in the middle of the pack. Here's ExxonMobil, two scenarios of Shell, IEA, Department of Energy here, or EIA. Woodmac is very optimistic on energy demand growth. They have a slightly higher GDP growth forecast than, than the rest of us, I think. Uh, and then MIT has a scenario, where they have a scenario, made a scenario study out to 2050, so I will compare it with that as well. And the same goes for oil. Um, I guess the main reason why, I think the main reason why ExxonMobil is, is uh, sli so, so depending, on the, <laughs> depending on the glasses you have on, so optimistic in terms of low energy demand growth or, 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 or so bearish in terms of energy demand growth, compared to us when you go out to 2040 is that they are more optimistic in terms of energy efficiency development. In particular, they have a very aggressive, in my view, a very aggressive assumption on, on the Chinese energy efficiency improvements when you get out from 2025 to 2040. That's one of the reasons why they are lower than us here. And the same, same then for, for oil, etc. I also have charts on, on gas and new renewables, but I'll, I, I won't bother you with those. So. That was uh, what I had planned to say, and uh, I'm ready to for questions if that's okay. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much. So we have about uh, 35 minutes for uh, questions. I'll just get it started with one or two, and then and then we'll just open it up. Uh, ask your question loudly. Please keep it in the form of a question, not a long speech or statement. And then I'll just quickly, if we need help, repeat it for folks who are watching uh, online. Um, I just want to be clear about one thing to clarify. In all the projections you showed throughout the whole thing for demand, for the mix of fuels, you said it was based on an assumption about regional climate regimes. Was there an explicit carbon price in all the, data, all the charts you just showed us? Or, or yeah. what did you assume about climate policy and how does that impact the numbers we just saw? Yeah. In terms of, uh, in, ter when, when in terms of our forecasts, what we do is we put in a, a price of carbon and, and the relative prices of oil and gas and coal and so on. So we, mod sort of we, we try to model the price of carbon, ba which, which in, in fact could be an explicit price of carbon like you have in a trading regime in Europe or a tax as we have in Norway. Uh, or it can be an implicit price guided by different types of regulations, like, the, like what you will get in the U.S. if you continue to ban coal-fired power plants and so on. But the way we model it is, is that we have a price. Uh, we have assumed that, the, that uh, the main regions will gradually move towards those types, some kind of regime that will put, an, put a price on carbon. Uh, we don't have it in Africa. But we, we have it in China. I, I think we have something in India. Uh, always in North America, uh, of course, Asia Pacific, and Europe. So not all the regions, but uh, and and we we phase it in gradually so that during the 20s you will have carbon pricing also in China, for instance. Mm -hmm. And and the movements we see there now indicate that that could be possible. So, and I was interested yeah. in the last slide you showed comparing the different outlooks. We have had Fatih Brol from the IEA here, and Adam Siminski from EIA, and Christoph Rule from BP. Can, besides total energy demand, can you give us a sense to just save us all a little work going and looking this up later? <laughs> what, what are the key, most striking differences if people were to look at all the different energy outlooks that you know international agencies and, and companies do, and, and, and why do they exist? What are the core differences and the assumptions that are leading to different results? Yeah, well, the main difference is, is to the extent that we have a combination of GDP growth and energy intensity assumption that differ. Then you get that's one that's what's drive, drive, driving the differences in in overall energy demand. And um, if I remember correctly, I think both Woodmac and BP are more up. They go to 2030, but they, but they're more optimistic about GDP growth than than we are, and, and not sufficiently optimistic on energy intensity. So they get a higher energy demand growth than most of than the others. Um, the other striking d difference is that some are more optimistic on oil, BP, I think, and, uh, and uh, I, I don't know why, but uh, and we are, on the other hand, together with at least one of the shell scenarios, more optimistic on gas. Um, 
that could be because we are too optimistic on OECD Europe in our case, but, uh, but that's uh, something we're looking into at the moment. Um, and then uh, there, is, uh, th there are slight differences also in, in terms of new, re uh, new renewables growth, uh, where some, are less, uh, some, some of our com competitors are less optimistic on new renewables than we are. We might be on the optimistic side in terms of putting too much faith on geothermal energy, but that's uh, more of a detail. So that uh, so so we come out relatively high on new renewables growth. Uh, the only the only ones that are higher than us there are shell, the, one of the shell scenarios. But that's a pretty extreme. That's an extreme scenario in terms of new renewables growth. Okay. So those are the sort of the key differences. I think. Great. Um, I have others, but I can come back to it. Let's open it up and then yeah, please if you could identify yourself and then ask question. So thoughts on the regulatory regime for particularly unconventional oil and gas development in North America and thoughts coming from the Norwegian experience and then also the outlook for nuclear, which I also had a question about when you showed, you know, the slide on how renewables and gas come at the expense of oil and coal, how nuclear fits into that in North mm -hmm. America, but then also globally. Globally, yeah. <clears throat> well, I guess in terms of regulatory regime, there's, a, uh, there's such a wide uh, variation across the globe that you have, I mean, when you model it like we do here, you, I mean, you have to make some, some kind of... Uh, of a common denominator or a common multiplier, and, and, and it's impossible to model it, model it very precisely anyway. And, and uh, in one sense, I guess, that uh, uh, what I said about uh, CO2 is that the, in, in one sense it's a bit of a paradox seen from, from Scandinavia, at least, that, that uh, the homo capitalism and sort of the, the market-oriented ec economy of the U.S. Uh, seems to be so much against market-based instruments in terms of climate policy. And, and, and prefer regulation. Uh, the good thing about it is that it actually works, right? So CO2 emissions in the US are going down, while where we have market-based uh, instruments like in Europe, CO2 emissions are going up at the moment because the price is too low. So, so, but, 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 so what we've tried to do is, is sort of, uh, um, we do not have any explicit um, limits on, for instance, for un we don't have any, any ceilings on unconventional oil or gas production caused by regulation, bans or whatever. Uh, we are not explicitly modeling the CO2 policy of the US, but we're, we're assuming that it will have a shape where you get an implicit price of carbon, that's a, and, and it will affect the relative prices of different types of energy carriers. So that's how we go about this. If you, if you ask us to write a paper on how we believe that the regulatory regime of Europe will develop, we can do that, but, that, but, we, but it's difficult to put that into the model. So it's a, it's a, we ha, you have to, yeah, you have you have to sort of average it out when we do this. In terms of nuclear energy, um, we were more optimistic about nuclear energy demand growth last year than we're now. So we believe that uh, we believe that the, the the Fukushima tragedy and and what's happening as a consequence of that, in particular in Europe, but also here, I guess it's it's will will sort of set back or limit the growth. Uh, that you otherwise would have had in nuclear energy. But we believe it will come back. Uh, we believe that, uh, uh, for instance, China needs to develop nuclear energy as well, <coughs> and, and that the technology will sort of come back. And, and when you look at Europe, what's going to happen, or so we were joking about it, is that sort of a, when, if Germany now fades out all its nuclear energy, they will, they will buy more electricity from France. <laughs> and, and that is produced by <laughs> by quite a bit of nuclear energy. And France has not talked about stopping its or, or dismantling its nuclear plants. So we think nuclear will come back. Uh, I, th I think the overall growth in nuclear energy production here is slightly higher than the overall energy demand. It's, it's, it's roughly uh, slightly higher than gas, I think, so 1.7%, something like that, per year on average. I'm just but, curious as a yeah. follow-up, you said that the good thing about regulation is it works, our emissions are down in the U.S. Is your sense that was driven by policy or by cheap gas and a weak economy? That, well, it was probably driven by cheap gas. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, of course, we, uh, the we, I mean, one of the reasons why CO2 emissions haven't grown much in the OECD area as such, uh, including, including the U.S., is, of course, the, the, the consequence of the financial crisis and, and lower anyway. and that's. That's one of the paradoxes in Europe now is that because energy, energy demand is so low, uh, demand, demand for, for, uh, for CO2 emissions is so low that the price of, of CO2 emissions is very low, right? So in, in one sense, the market works. 
but uh, but it's just that the politicians, when they set the ceiling of, of CO2 emissions in Europe, they 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 hadn't counted in the fact that you would have a uh, you would have a recession for two or three years. So it's uh, so it's a bit of a paradox, and uh, and it's it's, it's yeah, it's not all over Europe that CO2 emissions are going up, by the way, but it does it does go up in the countries where they like coal. Uh, okay, great. A bunch of hands. We'll go here. Yeah, the qu question was on the relationship between oil and gas prices or per unit of energy, and then, uh, then the, the challenge of methane emissions. Um, in terms of oil and gas, the ratio roughly is 5.8. So if you, if, you take, uh, if you take the oil price and at 100 and you divide it by 5.8, you get the equivalent gas price to compare it with. So when Henry Hub is three and a half dollars and then the oil price is 100, you divide it by six, you get 16. So, it's, so it's currently the oil price is five times as high as the gas price in the US, roughly, which is not sustainable over time, we think. Uh, and then in terms of methane, yeah, that, well, that's the, the myth, uh, emissions of the natural gas itself into the atmosphere is, of course, much more serious than burning it because um, methane has, is a more potent uh, greenhouse gas than, than CO2. So, so what is important for the oil industry as, uh, as a whole is to try and limit as much as possible of, of direct <coughs> CO2 uh, methane emissions, uh, which uh, is a lot about leakage. It's a lot about developing uh, new technology at, uh, where we have all, uh, old gas fields, et cetera. It's, uh, and that's something that we do a lot of work on. I think we even have a, a description of it in terms of how, we, how our approach to that is in, uh, in our gas fields in the US in our sustainability report. But that's, an, that's a tremendous challenge. And if you look at, uh, if you look at the pipelines in, in a country like Russia, for instance, there is, uh, there is bound to be methane leakage as well. So it's not only at the field, but it's it's also when you transport the gas for thousands of kilometers. So it's a, it's a challenge, and there's a difference between different regions in terms of how much of the gas that actually leaks out. Over here, and then in the back. Now the question is on on our assumptions for ethanol, <coughs> and as part of the the oil demand mix, I guess. Um, yeah, we assume we assume that the sort of the biofuels component, which is mainly ethanol, the biofuel component of overall oil demand will increase by, will roughly double, I think. So, so out of the, out of the 100, we have roughly 105 million barrels per day, 104, 105 million barrels per day at the top. Out of that, roughly four or five will be, four and a half, I think it is, biofuels, which is then roughly twice what we have today. So there's a, there's a growth there, but it's not, it's not substantial, and it's, it has, it's, well, it is substantial, but it's not dramatic. No, no, we think it will increase as a share of the, because, it, because the, the, the biofuel component here grows faster than the, than the underlying oil demand. So, so there's, a, there's an increasing share overall. How that actually is done is beyond my field of expertise, but, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, but um, we don't, we don't in, this, in this report, we don't model the, um, all the products that come out of the oil uh, refineries, right? So and that's globally yeah. you're talking about, right? That's globally, global yeah, right. globally. So, because I mean, and this is limited. The I mean, the, the biofuels today, as part of gasoline, is is limited to a relatively small number of countries. Yeah, and I think part of what's motivating the question is the blend wall that we're kind yeah. of just uh, we've just reached in the in the U.S. Yeah, and what yeah, that yeah. means for our future of our biofuel policy. Yeah. Um, there was a question in the back. The yeah. Back, yeah. So just for the people watching online, the question was about the sharp projected decline in energy intensity and what much sharper energy demand in emerging economies would do mm -hmm. to change that. Yeah, what, what's behind that forecast is that we, for, uh, first of all, we see that there are specific reasons why it has not declined over the last decade. Uh, <coughs> it, it has declined for a very long period, also before the chart that I showed. Uh, and, and the specific reasons are, are the, the uh, in particular, the energy intensive growth in manufacturing in China. Uh, we believe that both the, the gradual slight moderation of growth, the gradual change of the growth model in China, um, the currently very high energy prices, in particular on oil, will, will lead to, uh, and also the, 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 the sort of the saturation of the, or sort of the movement along the S-curve, as we say, in terms of the development of China, will, will lead the growth in China to be less energy intensive than it has been. 
And we don't see this, that being compensated by other emerging economies to the same extent. So that's one of the reasons why we see a, a, a return back to a trend. It's not much steeper than it was. In, in fact, it's slightly less steep in, in the start, at least. So that's the reason. That might be wrong. But as I said, one of the, uh, one of the big uncertainties is, is that the world has not experienced a period of $100 oil for five years previously. And it, that, this is $100 in real terms. It, there's a strong incentive. To, to energy intensity, especially at the, at the country level, when you look at the net import bill of a country like India or China in terms of oil, and so on. So, so that's what we believe. It could be wrong, but um, but that's uh, our best estimate. And so, implicit in that projection of sharp declining energy intensity is a very high oil price. Uh, and you showed yeah, us, or yeah, or right? a co continuation of price at roughly at today's level, or is it thereabouts? Right? Because there are a lot of different yeah. views out there on where we're headed in terms of oil supply, and even at some of the higher, it's not going to be twenty-five dollars, but there is a potential for a lot more oil to come on the market. F questions about OPEC's ability to kind of maintain discipline. Is, so how mm. how is without projecting prices too precisely? I mean, how, how should we think about the range? the oil prices that would change that energy mm. intensity pro pro projection? Is it like $80 well, I, I or think, it needs to drop to yeah, 40 or 50? I think one, one important realization is, uh, at least for me, has been that the, sort of the periods of high prices or low prices uh, always have, have in them uh, their seed of their own destruction. The, the, I mean, the reason why the oil price has been as high as it has been since, over the, since 2007, 2008, are, are basically two. One is the, the tremendous growth in demand driven by GDP growth in Asia. The other, another reason was that because of the low oil prices in 1997, 98, when the oil price was $10, uh, all the international oil companies <coughs> merged and reduced their exploration budgets. Uh, and demand increased, in, also in the OECD area. So, so periods of high prices lead us to explore more for oil. We do crazy things like looking, looking for oil uh, at 2,500 meters of, of sea depth and then 3,000 meters of drilling underneath salt, and we get it out. Uh, and and the, same the same thing, it, it, it does affect the driving season in the US, for instance, when you have high prices. So after a period of four or five years, you have lower demand and higher supply than you otherwise would have. That's lower prices and vice versa. So, so I tend to think that when, it, when you look at it over a long period, uh, the, sort of the, the span of oil prices is not between 30 and $300. It's somewhere between 60 and 140. And, but then it can go, it will spike up and down beyond that, and it can, but it can also for periods of four or five years be slightly above or slightly below. But it, but it does have this dynamic to it. And then you add in OPEC, uh, and, uh, and uh, they need a certain level of prices to, to keep their fiscal budgets in balance and keep their populations happy after the Arab Spring and so on. And you get, you get some kind of geopolitical risk premium on top of that. And then you have supply disruptions like Libya and like Syria and like Sudan. So, and then you, you put on our risk premiums, the IOC's risk premiums, and you, and you get a price that's slightly higher than, than the margin of cost. But yeah. So it's, Prices will go up and down, and not necessarily in that sequence. And just but, but we believe it will be, to, to put it, to, just to be clear, we believe it will be substantial, the oil price will be substantially higher over the next 30 years than it has been over the last 30 years on average. And currently it's twice as high. I just wanted to ask a uh, quick follow up to that. Does the fact that tight oil production can be ramped up and down much more quickly, rigs idled more quickly, suggest that the kind of volatility you said we've seen in the past might be minimized in the future? because we can respond more quickly to changes in price by adjusting supply? Yeah, yeah. what, what is uh, interesting there is that, uh, that uh, to some extent we've got an extra spare capacity element into the oil market, which is generally a medium term thing. So that when, when the market perceives that the OPEC spare capacity is increasing, it tends to dampen prices. And, and whether spare, capa spare capacity goes down like it did when Libya, when, uh, during the Libya, Libyan civil war, uh, uh, Prices spiked because of the perceptions of low spare capacity. Now it seems like the U.S. or the tight oil, in in a sense, could work in the same manner. Hmm. Prices are high; uh, you get a lot of extra production. The moment prices uh, come back, you cut back and, on rigs, and, and and in sort of in the oil industry, the production reacts very quickly. 
So in fact, you, you can't, we can't, might have a, a, a new spare capacity element in the old market, which w will tend to dampen uh, the medium term price variation. The question was about the impact of U.S. LNG exports. Yeah, and, and regional price differentials. Yeah. Uh, well, what, given, our, given our assumptions in terms of growth of, of uh, LNG supplies, there will be an element that tends to uh, react to price differentials um, more forcefully than what has happened um, previously. So we believe that there will be uh, influence of um, LNG exports from different regions on prices in other regions. So the, the, global mar the, the global gas market will integrate, not perfectly, but much more than it has been. And it, it will move in the direction of the oil market. And one of the interesting things is that this, uh, one of the paradoxes is that the oil market, especially here in North America, is, 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 is partly developing in the other direction. Right? Because, of, because of bottlenecks and infrastructure, you have low prices on certain qualities of oil and so on. <laughs> So, uh, and we see a tendency whereby um, LNG exports in, from North America could affect prices both in Europe and in Asia slightly differently, but, and, and we're a little bit uncertain how important that will be in terms, and, and how dependent that effect will be on the actual volumes. But we think the, the, the fact that, that the possibility for LNG exports will exist could have an impact on both the buyer and the sellers willing to, to pay for gas or, or sell gas and, and pay for gas. So that you, you could foresee where the exports out of North America into Europe could be the ceiling of European gas prices. Uh, the, same, the same way where it could be the floor of Asian gas prices. And then you can calculate yourself what that ceiling and floor will be, depending on how much it costs to transport and how much it costs to liquefy, et cetera. Um, but um, but and then, of course, the, sort of the size, the size of the impact depend, probably will depend some, somewhat on the physical, the size of the exports, whether, whether it's going to be 50 BCM or 100 BCM per year or whatever. But, but we think that there will be an impact there, even, even though it's not that big. But it's just that you can actually shift some loads. But then we might get another source of shale gas in Argentina or in Africa for that matter that could that that could ruin that picture of the US being the price <coughs> determinant in a sense but, uh, but we see that type of globalization of global gas markets going on and um, but LNG investments is difficult I mean you have to believe in a certain price differential for a very long period to be willing to invest in a liquid action facility right it's 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 not today's price differentials that, that, that determine the profitability of that type of investments I guess the market suggests some people think there will be that price differential for a while because yeah right? there, there will be a price differential for a while but uh, but I guess the comfort from an economist is that the <laughs> sort of at the end of the day you will probably re earn a normal profits on it and that's it right <laughs> so it's uh, yeah please uh, what are the steps that uh, you need to do in order to get to a uh, world LNG market, uh, especially on infrastructure? And do you see that these steps are taken by governments or IOCs uh, all over the world? Well, the steps will, I mean, we see the steps already. In a sense, it, because it depends on what what you mean by a global LNG market, right? It's uh, it, we will probably not come to a situation where there is sufficient LNG to to, to sort of take out all bottlenecks. When when you have a Fukushima in, in Japan, there's not sufficient LNG to immediately replace that, right? So there will be a price impact of those types of fallouts of <coughs> other competing fuels. But uh, but we we currently see LNG moving across the globe. And you can and you, and you can sh you can shift you can shift the, the load for, you can sell the load several times, so so there is a there is a spot type of spot market developing, um, with the supply increase that we now see from from Australia and then subsequently from Africa that that capacity will be much more. Uh, currently, the globe is a little in one sense very dependent on Qatari LNG, which is sort of the big surplus where, where they export a lot. So 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 that will develop. Um, IOCs will play a role mainly as, uh, as the ones that discover this. And if it's, uh, if it's a lower, large source of gas in a country that doesn't need it, or, or that doesn't like Qatar, or that, that doesn't have the infrastructure in place to utilize it like Algeria or 
Tanzania, then it will be LNG. And, and then depend, it, that depends on the framework conditions and, and, uh, and whether, the, whether the government will allow that to happen. And, and then, of course, the, the, there's also another big set of players here, which is uh, the NOCs. There are, country, there are national oil companies in, in other countries that have a lot of gas. So, and that will affect the global gas market as well. So there's a large number of players here. Um, huge investments, needs a lot of capital, and at the end user, I mean, one of the challenges is that the, a lot of this gas will be electricity. And, and electricity also needs a lot of infrastructure investments. There's a lot of estimates out there about how much gas the U.S. might export. The ballpark range in the middle is kind of around 5, 6 BCF a day is what the global market would take. Does that sound right to you? Or do you think with rising Australian costs and other things, the global market could actually take a lot more U.S. gas and more of these projects might get built? You know, five, six BCF a day sounds very much like it was made by us, the forecast. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, there you go. No, but, but there is a large range, right? I mean, and if you, if you look at it, I mean, uh, the capacity could be more, and then not all of it could be utilized. But, uh, so it's, uh, but somewhere between 50 and 100. It depends how much you want to use yourself. Right? And it's, uh, it's also, I mean, it's, a, it's an energy policy issue as well. And, I, and, and seen from the U.S. point of view, would it uh, could probably make, make more sense to export more at world market prices than to de facto subsidize manufacturing at home. But um, that's, a, that's an economist's point of view and not a politician's <laughs> point of view. We have the same debate in Norway, to put it that way. We, we export 100 BCM per year, and we don't use anything at home, but, uh, or hardly anything. But, uh, Two questions here. here and now the question is, uh, is uh, relating to what it, what it would take and what it would mean for global economic development if we were to, instead of investing in, in energy demand based on fossil fuels, and invest in something that leads us to the to 450 ppm scenario, I guess. Um, I guess one of the, one of the challenges is that uh, uh, what is fundamentally driving uh, energy demand, and therefore also the use of fossil fuels, is GDP growth. Uh, and it's difficult to see uh, how you can get to very much lower or that much lower CO2 emission trajectories without doing something about global GDP. Um, we haven't sort of <clears throat> we haven't figured out yet. We haven't seen yet the economic model that gives us the same amount of growth but with much less CO2 emissions. And and uh, and and. Given the capital stock that we have, given we're talking about you're talking about large number of cars. I mean, half the cars that are bought today will still be on the road in 2025. So some of these capital stocks take a long time to change. All the existing power plants, etc. We can not just mothball them and, and believe it doesn't have an impact on economic growth. So that, that's the that's the crucial question. And then the then the second question becomes: that, Well, what if we do that? Can we do that and then compensate the emerging economies for that? Um, that's um, uh, it's an income transfer that I think uh, is difficult to foresee. It's it, and that's also what we're struggling with is to find a model whereby uh, whereby we could allow emerging economies to grow and at the same time grow with less use of energy and less use of fossil fuels. It's it's um, uh, but on the other hand, if I mean. McKinsey and Vattenfall produced this, uh, this uh, stacked costs of CO2 emissions, uh, reducing CO2 emissions. And, and, uh, and the conclusion of that is that if everybody had the same level of CO2 prices as we do in Norway, we would solve it. Because we would, in, we would, in, we would have incentives to increase the energy efficiency so much that we would, and energy efficiency measures here just, they are profitable by definition. The problem is that they don't happen. I mean, it, it's, that's, that's the problem. The problem is, to, why don't we insulate buildings? Uh, it is profitable to do it. You, you, it costs less than your saved electricity bill, but we still don't do it sufficiently. And it, has, it probably has to do with it. It's uh, old buildings, takes a long time, lots of decision makers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We don't, we don't have the framework conditions in place. And on, glo on a global scale, that's a huge challenge. Um, the IEA scenario, 450 ppm scenario, they assume the same amount of growth, same GDP growth, 
in that scenario as in their new policy scenario by sort of by default they assume that but but they're not very good at explaining how that can come about yeah but there's yeah but it has but the revenue side the revenue side of a climate measure is avoidance of future costs and that revenue does not accrue by 2035 it's later right so how you get that into the GDP equation before 2035 is, the, is one of the big questions. Um, what they're also doing is saying, or implicitly saying, is that consumer prices for, for oil or energy will be roughly 50% higher than producer prices. So you have a producer price of oil of about 100 in that scenario and a, and a, and a consumer price of 150. That is consumer taxes in China and Germany. And how that income transfer to, from Saudi Arabia and Russia to China and Germany and, and consumer countries actually will take place. And, and if it will be possible is also a big question. So, so we have time for probably mm -hmm. two more brief questions. So there's one here, and then we'll go over here. The question was about time frame for penetration of LNG as a bunker fuel. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I showed it on this. Uh, you had this. Uh, small sliver of, of gas demand on top of it. And, and I think what we're, uh, our estimate is roughly that by 2035 or something, like towards the end of the period, we have, we have taken out roughly 10% of international bunkers. So out of oil and into gas. That's the time frame. And, and in terms of whether we see that happening, I guess some of the regulations, in, in particular about co coastal near uh, uh, shipping, both here and in Europe, is one indication that this will happen. So it's, uh, that's, that's basically what's behind it. And then we see, uh, in terms of not international bunkers, but also transportation, we see LNG and trucking being discussed. And, and Shell is one of the companies that are looking at that. Over here, yeah. Uh, I'm Steve Kovitz. I'm the Managing Director of Federalist West Coast Carrier Network. Um, you had said that GDP growth is linked to CO2 emissions. Behind that, what causes CO2 emissions are fossil fuels. Right, so oil, gas, and coal. Now, on the as with respect to oil specifically, you had stated that oil prices are high historically and these economies have not yet adjusted to these high oil prices, which would suggest that oil is a binding constraint on economic activity. Are you making the argument that oil is, con is constraining GDP growth? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, I guess that uh, uh, oil as a fuel uh, is uh, highly conducive to economic growth together with other energy sources when you look at it on a global perspective. It's uh, because there is a link between, or there's this uh, sort of this bilateral relationship between energy and GDP growth. Uh, transportation drives GDP growth. Transportation is highly associated with oil, still. Uh, so you need oil. If you have oil, you have more transportation. We could have more transportation in some areas of the world if oil prices were lower, in particular in the US. And it's, it's the best example where oil demand depends on the oil price because you hardly have any taxes. And, and uh, there's a very tough competition. and. and tough competition between refineries and, and refinery companies, and, and you are, the consumers here are actually exposed to the global oil price. In Europe, we're, we're, we have a big cushion which is called 50% consumer taxes. Uh, in China, and uh, still, not that much yet, uh, anymore, but, but in Saudi Arabia, as an example, they have a huge cushion called subsidies. So that, uh, so that the, the, the gasoline price in, in Saudi Arabia is, uh, is uh, 1 15th of what it is in Norway, as an example. So therefore, the, the link is not that clear because of taxes and consumption. And, and then you have some countries might be worried about their net import bill. So to the extent that that has an input, their net imports, their, their current balance in terms of their macroeconomic accounting has an impact on their growth, et cetera. That oil price could also limit growth somewhat. But I, I think that the, the, the story is complex. It's, uh, you need energy to grow. When you grow, you use more energy. So it's sort of this symbiosis between those two. And, and it's, it is very much the same with gas, with oil, I'm sorry. But, um, but then when you have 
the, the type of relative price developments that we've had lately, you could also make the story that increased, increased use of gas and less use of oil in some regions <coughs> could actually foster economic growth because it, you pay less for it. Gas is cheaper than, natural gas is cheaper than oil. Well, those of you who are regulars at Center on Global Energy Policy Events know we are relentless and rigorous about ending on time. So we have one more minute left. We're going to end on time. Uh, you showed a bunch of historic numbers and projections which looked like, like an EKG up and down, up and down, and then the projections were flat. So the one thing we know about projections is they're probably wrong. So uh, hopefully you can come back in a year and share with us what actually happened and how your projections are different. Everyone here will have heard from lots of other companies and, uh, and uh, NGOs and the IEA and the EIA between now and then. We'll have lots more questions. But uh, please join me in thanking uh, Eric and Statoil for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.